Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back after our short interval. But we had also a short session just prior to Maghrib. But I think from next week, London Maghrib will be before my slot. It will be in the uh, slot just before me. Um, so therefore, Maghrib Azan Waghera should be done by that time. And in fact, probably I will need to pray my Maghrib um, either in the slot prior to my session or have a short break in the middle, otherwise it's going to get too late uh, until Maghrib then becomes after seven. Anyway, Maghrib is moving, the days are getting shorter, that means, and uh, soon, not too far from now, end of October most likely, which it usually is every year, the time will change, we will go back to GMT, and that will be, you know, one hour back than where we are now, because in summertime we add an hour uh, BST, British summertime. We add one hour to our time uh, to push the clocks forward, and then we go back to our normal times when we get into winter. So then it will fly back, basically. Maghrib will be nearly sort of half past five or something like that. Uh, and then we won't have no qualms really with Maghrib, Isha. Obviously, there's no problem with Isha because you can pray it late. So today and tomorrow is a little bit squeaky time to be praying it as late as I will be praying it. But from next week, inshallah, uh, most likely I will pray it before I start or pray it just as I come on air. It's very important with Maghrib that we pray as soon as possible after the sunset. Obviously, we take into consideration uh, the uh, refraction of the, uh, um, the light, which we've done the research for. Uh, so you'll see that on our Wifaqul Ulama website and the details will be there. Let me share with you the phone number for you to phone in order to get your questions through to us and hopefully get your queries answered. The questions and the queries that you will need to ring for is on 01274 214299. That's 01274 214299. On the other hand, if you wish to email, then please email on q and a at ikra.tv. We will be with you now with a slightly longer session for another at least nearly 30 minutes, alhamdulillah. So you've got plenty of time to get your questions in. So no hesitation, people. Let's call in. Whilst we're waiting for the calls to come in, let's deal with some of the queries that we've already received via our Darul Ifta channels. And let's start with the ladies first. Okay. They always say, don't they? Ladies first. So ladies first. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I pray you are well. I bought a new abaya for £40 and got a £3 discount. I gave the abaya to the tailor for alterations. When I went to pick it up, I noticed that the alterations were wrong and he had burnt the abaya with the iron. A middleman gave me the £40 which I asked for and the shop kept the abaya. I recall once in the shop that I bought it for £37 but because of the dispute, I left with the £40 in a hurry and forgot to mention the discount. When I came home, I realized, recalled that with the discount, I'd pay £37 for the buyer. Am I under any obligation to give him the £3? If so, do I pay the middleman £3? As I do not know if the tailor had paid the middleman for paying for my buyer, which he damaged. If I do have to return the £3, can I give it to someone who can give it to me? As I don't want to go back to him. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, this middleman, as you refer to him, he is the one that gave you the £40 because you had informed him that you had bought that abaya for £40. So he recompensed you the full price of the abaya, knowing that the tailor had done the damage. But obviously, you didn't pay £40, you paid £37. So the actual price of the abaya is £37, not £40. So yes, you would return the £3 to the person who paid you the £40, which from your message seems to be the middleman. And no, you do not need to personally have to give it to him. You can pass it on to somebody and say, please give this £3 back to the middleman, explaining that it is sister so-and-so, uh, who is a buyer that was uh, damaged. Uh, so at least he can identify who you are, and then he can take the money like that. So there is, there's no requirement for you to physically hand it over to him. So that is that. Um, next one, going back to this. If the artist writes vocals only, are we allowed to listen to them? A lot of Nasheed artists use vocal sounds. Artists like Muad, Saif Adam, Seed, Ilyas, Mao. No, don't, don't know any of them. <laughs> uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I assume when you say that these artists use vocals only, that they make sounds of instruments using their voices. 
So they might make a sound like a drum beat with their voice. They may make a sound which can be altered to make a sound like a guitar or a synthesizer or something like that. The problem is there's nothing wrong in using the voice like a, a, a beat, like they used to call in beatboxes back when I was a kid. Um, and, you know, folk used to rap on street corners and people used to use their voice as a beatbox. So there's nothing wrong in doing that, but when an instrument or a computer is used to alter the voice, to make it sound like a musical instrument, then it's a musical instrument, you know. Just because its origin is the human voice doesn't mean that it's okay. Um, so anything which is distinctively the human voice, where it's a beatbox where you're actually just, you know, beat, you know making noises with your mouth, uh, and it can be categorically seen that you're making noises with your mouth, um, then that is fine. Uh, but it's only but when it starts to be synthesized then it's a problem. Having said that about the beatbox, obviously if it becomes very rhythmic, okay, and you're now starting to, you know, kind of like feel like you want to move with the sound, uh, then it's problematic, okay? There's nothing wrong with having a beatbox, just like having a beat, okay? Because even when a person speaks, he speaks in rhythm. You know, if you're singing, uh, if you're, you're, you're singing couplets of poetry, uh, then you say it with, with rhythm. With, with, with balance, uh, you know, verse, uh, verse and verse. Um, you don't just kind of read it out, you know, in a monotonous tone, you know, there he was, you know, there'll be did it, did it, doom, did it, did it, doom, and there'll be that same rhythm all the way through it. So there's nothing wrong in that. But when we see, and I, I don't know, I'm not, I don't know of these artists, but I, I know of the concept that people take, still take the human voice, but then synthesize it, okay, put it through a computer. And there's somebody sent me a video once and it was basically like a, a, I don't know how many, you know, like a 40 instruments uh, orchestra, all based on the human voice. You could not tell that that was just the human voice. It sounded like a full orchestra. You know, sometimes a voice sounded like a trumpet, you know, because it basically synthesized it using a computer, changed the pitch, changed the tone, um, you know, played around with the voice played one over the other, and he made like a full orchestra just from the human voice. So that shows it's possible to do anything nowadays with computers and with synthesizers. The human voice raw, um, which is usually, like I said, the beatbox, then there's, there's, there's little harm in that, okay? So that deals with the questions from the ladies group. We're going to move to the gents group. But before I do, um, I'm going to remind you Brothers and sisters, that the phone number to call is 01274 214299. That's 01274 214299. Please do get your calls in um, because these last 20 minutes now, because a lot of the questions I've dealt with the ladies has taken up some time. Take advantage of it. This is for you. Okay, 01274 214299. So let me go and scroll up with the question from the gents group. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh muftisab. I hope you and your family are well. Just a question to this answer. I saw in this group in an answer that non-flowing blood is not najis. In the last answer, I think you said blood on the wound is najis but doesn't break wudu. Can you please explain the two answers so I can understand it better? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What we mean by non-flowing blood is that blood which is has reached viscosity has become somewhat solidified. So it's no longer in the liquid form. It's either become, um, I forgot the word, what happens when blood dries? It's, um, oh, it's gone on my head. When blood is obviously left at the oxygen level, it will start to dry out and it will form a scab. And there's a process whilst it's forming that scab. But when it blood is blood, okay, still as a liquid, then it is considered as najis. The difference is now, is it going to be considered as violating your wudu or not violating your wudu? Well, we know inside our body, we have blood. We know inside our body, we have urine. We know inside our body, we have feces. So does that mean that we're always in a state of najis? Does that mean that we can't pray salah? Of course not. Why not? Because that blood, that urine, that nudges is inside our body. As soon as the urine comes out of our body, then our wudu is nullified. As soon as the feces comes out of the body, our wudu is nullified. 
As soon as the blood comes outside of the body, our wudu is nullified. And anywhere that the urine falls, it becomes najis, and we have to clean that part of the body or that cloth. Anywhere feces falls, then we have to clean that, remove the feces, wash the clothes or whatever it is. And anywhere blood falls, then we have to also cleanse that and clean it. However, if blood, if you have an open gash wound, which is probably not a good thing, but let's just say you've, you've cut your finger somehow, and there's blood there. You can see there's blood there, but the blood is not coming outside of your, of your cut. It's staying within your cut. Then it is as though it is still inside your body. It's not made its way onto your skin. It's not come out of your body. And as I said, there's always blood in our body. We would be dead if there was no blood in our body. So we would still consider, even though it's an open cut, because the blood is within the body, it is still considered as uh, not nullifying wudu. But if you took your jubba sleeve and dipped your jubba sleeve into the wound, and now you've got blood on your, on your jubba sleeve, now that is najis on your jubba sleeve. This will be the same way, I know as disgusting as it sounds, if you were to dip your uh, jubba sleeve you know, inside the posterior and bring back feces or something, or so of to that effect. So I hope you can understand the distinction between the two. Barakallah feek for the du'as. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, keep you and your family well. Amin. Okay, next question. Um, in relation to this, what should be done during Ramadan for iftar in masjid? If, for instance, the time differs and adhan is called according to the masjid time, it would seem strange or at least seem or at least see masjid times are doubted or delaying iftar or cause others to doubt their timings if those that follow fark and a masjid wait a few extra minutes to do iftar. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I don't think that will be the case. You know, if anything, it will be a minute or two. And what can happen is rather than breaking the fast as soon as you hear the, the takbir of the adhan, you know, just wait a little bit, let a couple of the takbirats go, let the tashahud, you know, the uh, ashadu wa la maybe ashadu wa and then and then break your fast. There's no harm in delaying it for that minute or so. And as I've said previously, when people say, oh, well, you know, azan starts and, you know, Azan normally in most masjids is more than four minutes. It's at least three, but I'm pretty sure it goes more than four minutes. With the, it does with the, with the muaz in the eye listen to. It's, it's quite a long adhan. So there's plenty of time for a person to just wait a couple of minutes and break the fast. And it shouldn't cause any doubt. You shouldn't say anything. If someone says, break your fast, say, yeah, your brother, I'm breaking my fast. You shouldn't say to him, oh, why are you breaking your fast now? Because you're breaking it in the wrong time. Your fast isn't valid. Let him do his thing. You do your thing. Alhamdulillah, you've done your research. You've come to an understanding, you have know the ulama that you're following, have a good understanding of timings of salah, so you're fine. For them, if they do say to you, oh, I've noticed, brother, that you wait a few minutes before you break your fast. Is there any reason for this? Say, yeah, there is. Read this material. Because if you're not an expert on the area, then all you're going to do is cause confusion. So say, look, read this material, go to this website, uh, read this mufti's uh, uh, research, and then you can make your own mind up. And then you can at least relay, discuss it with uh, the committees of the masjids uh, because at the end of the day make the decisions about the salah times and say, look, could we by any chance delay our maghrib by a few minutes? If they say, why? Say, well, because we have read this research and share that research. And if they say, no, 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 we've also got research and our research doesn't, doesn't show that we have to add three minutes and say, with all due respect, can you show me that research? And if you find that they cannot show you that research, then you know it's, this is just based on their own uh, position, which is not based on any evidence. Now you have a choice. Now you can actually continue to pray in that masjid or find another local masjid that you can pray in, that your ti the timings you're more comfortable with. Or you continue to pray in that masjid. That's your choice. These are decisions that we will make. Um... Assalamu alaikum. When traveling and praying a congregational prayer with locals outside the masjid, is it preferred for a local to lead the prayer? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's not necessary that the locals read the prayer. 
it should be uh, the best reciter out of all of them or that person who is already a dedicated imam of that area. If it is a dedicated imam of that area, then he should lead because that's his job basically, that's his role and he shouldn't be moved aside by somebody else. If there is no dedicated imam and these are just a bunch of friends moving from one place to another or they decide to pray salah because they haven't made it to the masjid in time so they just park up and there's a nice field there, they get out, they're going to pray in the field. Now they're deciding who should lead. Then obviously the one who knows the sunnah the best, he should lead. The one who has most knowledge should lead because there's no point putting somebody forward when he does not know the ahkam of salah. So he does not know what is a nullifier of wudu or what is a nullifier of salah or if he breaks wind, how to see bring the next person behind him forward and the person behind him, does he know what he's supposed to do? So, you know, this is going to become so confusing. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ruling on eating vegan-based meals from places which sell haram, such as McPlant from McDonald's. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ruling on eating vegan based meals from places which sell haram, such as McPlant from McDonald's. I think that is what is the ruling? Well, even if a place sells permissible and impermissible items and you go eat to consume the permissible, then there's no harm in doing so. We go to supermarkets all day long, you know, whatever the company is of the supermarket. We walk into shops all day long. Uh, convenience stores uh, to buy things okay oops sorry I didn't press record let me see. I, didn't, I didn't even answer this question so uh, oh good perfect uh, we have a caller who's called in on 01274 214299 assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam sheikh how are you I am very well thank you my brother you keeping well yourself very well Jabri from North Wales yes I thank recognize you. you I know it's been a while but uh, I, I, I picked up your voice straight away alhamdulillah Thank you very much. Family okay? Alhamdulillah. Very well. Thank you for asking. Barakallah okay. Feek. Sheikh, what it is, as you know yourself, uh, our monarch, uh, monarch Queen Elizabeth has passed away since last week. And uh, what are your thoughts as Muslims? What respect can we show her? Especially if you can express it to our viewers, especially who are in business of retail, cafes, restaurants, supermarket. Can you enlighten their knowledge, please? Because uh, I, please forgive me if I don't quote it hundred percently. Once our Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went away and when he came back, this lady that used to throw water while he was passing. If I'm not wrong, I'm sure she was a sister Hebrew. I hate using the word Jewish, yes. And our beautiful Nabi asked his companions, what has happened to this lady? I have not seen her throwing water at me, in front of me or the back of me. They said, message of Allah, she has passed away. Uh, if I am quoting it correctly, please accept it. If I'm not, please uh, correct me. And then our beautiful Nabi went to her grave and made dua. Am I right there or wrong there? I'll explain it whilst I'm discussing the, the whole Queen Masala. Okay, Jazak Malakhir yep. Malakhir. Yep. It's just okay. in about, unfortunately, a lot of our people don't realize this is a blessing from our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our beautiful Nabi that we should respect the location that we live in. And we live here, we respect here, we pay our taxes here, and we've got more freedom of practicing our belief, our beautiful religion in this country than anywhere else. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me. Even now, I have been told by my brothers and sisters back in Saudi Arabia, right? The, the, they are now only allowed to study the Holy Quran three hours in a week. And listen to this now. Yet, they are allowed to do yoga eight hours a week. So could you imagine what is happening to the Ummah and what is happening to our beautiful religion? Mm. And mashallah, mashallah, here we are in the United Kingdom that you get some idiots who are Islamic phobia mad, right? But at the same time, this beautiful Prince, sorry, King Charles, if anybody ever look at him, how 
love he has got for Islam, how much he coaxed such beautiful scholars of Islam. So as a Muslim, should we not be showing 100% dedication and respect for our monarch who has passed away? So, alhamdulillah, jazakum khairan, brother, for calling a pertinent question. Uh, I'm sure it's on the minds of many. Maybe uh, the people couldn't ring in and articulate it in the manner our brother has. Uh, maybe they just weren't sure whether that was an appropriate question to ask or not, but it absolutely is. So I think from my nodding and from also what the brother was saying, let's put the facts out there first. Factually, we are British citizens, you know, for those of us who are British citizens, or we are on the way to becoming British citizens. In fact, we are pretty much economic migrants. We came here uh, due to the Commonwealth, um, which were usually, if we go even further back, countries which were colonized by the, uh, the British Empire. Uh, and then it became known as the Commonwealth, and the doors of uh, migration opened uh, to uh, citizens of the Commonwealth to come and help the UK, which in essence is why our fathers turned up here, or grandfathers for some people, uh, which was to help the UK economically get back on its feet post-World War II uh, because of the lack of manpower, uh, because pr primarily men were the working force, in what you would consider to be labour-intensive jobs, whether that's mining, bus driving, weaving, you know, those sorts of things which were relatively low-skilled, uh, didn't require much of an education, but required a lot of man-hours, a lot of man-hours. And uh, therefore, we en masse kind of, you know, shipped over literally from Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Wagera, and obviously parts of Africa and, and other nations and, and came here. And we were given jobs here, or when I say we, our grandparents or parents were given job here. So if I speak about myself personally, then what have I gained from this country? Well, I've gained a lot of education from this country. Every aspect of my schooling, university, madrasa even, every aspect of my learning, every aspect of my education has come from this country. Let's not, you know, let's not beat around the bush. Uh, medically, I've been assisted literally since the day I was born. I was born in a hospital here in the UK, and then I've, you know, used the uh, NHS uh, system all the way up. Yes, it's got its flaws now. Uh, you know, in the, in the, in the 2020s, uh, but times were very different <laughs> back in the 80s, 90s. The service was different. Uh, unfortunately, this is more to do with um, capitalism and the privatization of public institutes than to do with uh, the queen. And the queen, so therefore, as citizens, and I've always given, then the queen is our queen. She's our monarch. Uh, and we are told to respect our leaders. So she is our leader. Now we know the monarchy, what role it plays now in society compared to the role it played maybe a hundred years ago, five hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. It's considerably different. Absolutely is. Because we're slowly trying to move away from this uh, kind of one person in charge of everything. Uh, we're trying to move to more consultative leadership. And that's why we have a parliament. Uh, and we have a House of Lords and a House of Parliament. So even though we have a Queen, or now we have a King, it's it's a it's a kind of a nominal role. It's not a it's not a it's not a you know judicial powerful role. The government, the the legal system is 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 what gives it that powerful role. So should we show respect? Absolutely, we should show respect. Now I know there's many of us, or there are many there may be many amongst us that are anti-monarchists. You know, it's a freedom of speech. There are many anti-monarchists that are non-Muslims, you know, fine. Um, you know, that, that's, this, is, this is the bit where the brother mentioned that we have the freedoms. We have the freedom to even express that. But we do not like a monarchy system. We want to be a republic or, or whatever, like say, you know, in France or something. Or we want a completely different model of, of, of uh, governing. Uh, and we shouldn't be, a, 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 you know, monarchy is something for the dark ages or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we were to take the, uh, uh, you know, the, the role of the Prophet ﷺ, then the Prophet ﷺ respected leaders of other states. He absolutely did. Uh, whether it was the Byzantium leader, uh, he addressed him respective, respected, with respect. He did not 
uh, dis, uh, engage with him in a disrespectful way. He accepted gifts from uh, non-Muslim leaders. He took them, whether it was a mule, uh, whether it was a slave girl, uh, he would re uh, receive them. He did not send them back to say, sorry, we don't take gifts from, from, from non-Muslims. Uh, and the story which our brother mentions is as Rasulullah used to walk past this particular lady's house, she would throw her trash, she would throw thorns, she would throw anything and everything on the Prophet just to ridicule him, to, to embarrass him, to degrade him, to humiliate him. Obviously, it didn't humiliate the Prophet The Prophet had, had skin of an alligator, alhamdulillah. You know, sticks and stones did not break his bones, never mind words. After a few days, he, he notices that the, this is not happening anymore. So he asks the question that, oh, you know, um, there was a lady here, what's wrong with her? So they said she's ill, she's not well, she's sick. So the Prophet Islam went and visited her. And obviously, when a person does so much wrong to another person, and all that person does in return is love and respect, then I don't care, it doesn't matter how hard that person's heart is, that little bit of chink of light will come in and think, SubhanAllah, you know, I'm just abusing this brother, I'm just being disrespectful to this brother, I'm just hating on this brother, and this brother just smiles at me. How much more hate can a person have when that next guy is just smiling at you? You know, and he's not doing, exa you know, he's not returning the evil you're giving to him. Remember this, that when someone does evil to us, and we perpetuate that evil onto somebody else, then all we're doing is continuously keeping evil circulating in the world. However, if we show love in place of evil, then we stop the evil. I always give this very mundane example. So imagine you're on a road and it's very busy, and somebody wants to come in from a side junction onto this main road. So you see the guy, so you flash him in and you know, Bismillah, come in. And he comes in, smiles, puts his hand up, and he's now ahead of you. What's the chances now he's going to let somebody in? Pretty high. Okay, pretty high. The chances are pretty high that he's going to let somebody in. But if you saw him, and you ignored him, and you drove past him, then what are the chances that eventually when he gets into that road, that he's going to do the same? It's not going to happen. Okay, it's not going to happen. So, you know... She is our monarch, she is our queen, uh, you know, we can remember her for the good that she's done. Uh, I'm sure if she didn't want us to come into this country, those of us, our parents who are migrants, I'm sure she could have put a stop to it. She is the queen. Um, and we don't disrespect or hate on people who have done good for us. Uh, and there's nothing wrong in, you know, offering condolences to, to non-Muslims. In fact, it is something which is commendable. If you have non-Muslims at work and they lose a loved one, you don't ignore it. You say, you know, sorry for your loss. Uh, sorry to hear that. Ha! If we then take the next step forward and say, okay, you know, I'm going to make dua for them or may they rest in peace or things of that nature, now we don't know, you see, because if that person is not a Muslim, then the halat of that person is not going to be the same as a believer. That's something we do know. Uh, so we don't get into that co conversation because that's not a conversation to be having. I feel uncomfortable even having that conversation because somebody's lost a mother. Somebody's lost a grandmother. You know, somebody's lost a great grandmother. And, you know, why would I, should I be discussing about where their final destination is? It's not right. It's not, I wouldn't want anybody, if I lost my mother or grandmother, you know, they're human. I wouldn't want anybody to be debating on whether she's going to Jannah or Jahannam. Wala hawla wala quwata. I would at that particular time say, look, this is not the time and place to be having that kind of discussion. What's done is done now. You know, she's passed away. Um, and yeah, you know, the, the point that we've made there with regards to the royal family, of course, they've got their problems, like every other family has problems. And there's a number of people who've been involved in things and whether they're allegations or have been proven, I guess we'll have to wait and see. But the main point is that we are people who show respect to all people and especially show respect to the dead. The reason being is their matter is now closed. They are now gone on to the next domain. Us discussing them and debating them is not going to make any difference to them. So there we've got some live uh, pictures coming in uh, from, I'm assuming, uh, um, Palace of Westminster. 
in which the uh, queen is in uh, lying in state, I think it's referred to, uh, and, and people are visiting. Anyway, uh, we've now run out of time. See you all tomorrow, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.